right, let's begin from uh, where we left off last time. Right? Odysseus was feasting with the people of Phaeacia, and Demodocus, the blind bard, right, sings the song of the fall of Troy. And what's Odysseus' response? Pardon? He starts to cry. Yes, he begins weeping and pouring little drops out of his goblet of wine, right? Does anybody know why he's pouring out drops of wine from his glass? <clears throat> exactly, yeah, it's a tribute to his dead friends, right? People still do this, right? People still pour out drops of alcohol in honor of dead friends, right? Now, what this is um, in kind of miniature form is an example of what's called a chthonic sacrifice. That's C-H-T-H-O-N-I-C. You remember how we talked about um, normal forms of sacrifice um, in the ancient world, right? The, the way the Mesopotamians did it, the way the ancient Israelites did it, right? If you wanted to talk to the, to the gods in the sky, what did you do? You went on top of a mountain. Yeah, you went on top of a mountain, you built an altar, and you made your sacrifice there, right? So the smoke would go up to the sky gods, and they would receive it. If you want to talk to the gods that live in the earth, say the gods of the underworld, logically, what would you have to do? Yeah, you have to dig a hole or pour things on the ground, right? So you want to talk to the gods in the sky, you send things up into the sky. You want to talk to the gods in the ground, you pour things on the ground. Right? We will see Odysseus um, do a sort of much more formal version of this when he actually goes to visit the land of the dead. But I just wanted you to sort of keep this in mind, right? That that's what is going on, right? That he's making an offering to the gods, to the spirits below the earth. Now, <clears throat> you may have noticed as well this little verbal formula that pops into the epic just about whenever Odysseus is about to say anything to his host here, right? And Odysseus, his great mind teeming, What do we know about Odysseus? What do we know about the kind of hero he is? He's a cunning hero. Exactly, he's a cunning hero. He's a trickster hero, right? He's not a hero who is noted for his forthrightness or his honesty. He is not a hero who's necessarily noted for <coughs> physical strength, although he seems to have plenty of that as well, right? The, his main attribute is his cunning, his cleverness. And so, when every time he's about to talk to his host, it says his great mind teeming, what does this remind us of about Odysseus? He's possibly like, planning and plotting. Yeah, everything's a plot, right? Everything this guy does is calculated. Right? If he's sitting weeping and pouring out little drops of wine. Right? He doesn't do this because he feels all the feelings, right? He does this because he sees some potential advantage in it for himself. So he introduces himself on page 426 to his host, right? My Lord Alcinous, 
What could be finer than listening to a singer of tales such as Demodocus with a voice like a god's? Nothing we do is sweeter than this. A cheerful gathering of all the people, sitting side by side throughout the halls, feasting and listening to a singer of tales. The tables filled with food and drink, the server drawing wine from the bowl and bringing it around to fill our cups. For me, this is the finest thing in the world. So what does he start his speech with? Flattery. Flattery of his host, yep. Alcinous, you're a great guy, and all of this is awesome, right? The same way he approached Alcinous' daughter when he washed up on the shore, right? He started with flattery, comparing her to a goddess, comparing her to a virgin goddess to announce his honorable intentions, right? And he's doing something similar here now with her father, right? He's buttering the guy up. Sure. Well, and in honoring Demodocus, right, he's honoring the king Demodocus serves. Demodocus is not necessarily, but quite likely a slave. Um, oftentimes, um, musicians, bards, teachers, tutors who lived in a rural, a, a royal household um, in Greece would have been uh, would have been slaves. They were not free people. So doing honor to Demodocus does honor to Alcinous, right? Does honor to his to his master. But you have a mind to draw out of me my pain and sorrow and make me feel it again. Where should I begin? Where end my story? Heaven has sent me many tribulations. I will tell you my name first so that you too will know who I am and when I escape the day of my doom, I will always be your friend and host though my home is far. I am Odysseus, great Laertes' son, known for my cunning throughout the world and my fame reaches even to heaven. My native land is Ithaca, a sunlit island with a forested peak called Neritone, visible for miles. Many other islands lie close around her, Dolician, Same, and wooded Zethinthus, off toward the sunrise. But Ithaca lies low on the evening horizon, a rugged place, a good nurse of men. No sight is sweeter to me than Ithaca. Yes, Calypso, the beautiful goddess, kept me in her caverns, yearning to possess me. And Circe, the witch of Aea, held me in her halls and yearned to possess me. But they could not persuade me or touch my heart. Nothing is sweeter than your own country and your own parents, not even living in a rich house, not if it's far from family and home. But let me tell you of the hard journey homeward Zeus sent me on when I sailed from Troy. So he starts the flattery, and then what does he sort of build up to? What does he lead into? Okay, yeah, he's building up to telling the story of what happened after Troy, right? But what's the point that he wants to make? Yeah, the whole, you know, click your heels and get to Kansas thing, right? There's no place like home. There's no place like your own country. However interesting, however amazing other places might be however good life could have been with Calypso or with Circe, right, it's not home. And remember what the basic unit of society was for the ancient Greeks. Do you recall from last time what they called that? What the word was for it? Yeah. the single family unit, right? The single family home for the Greeks is the building block of society. And what we get in Odysseus's journeys throughout sort of the remaining books in the story that he tells to the Phaeacians, do we have any way, by the way, of verifying that his story is true? We have absolutely no way to know, right? Why not? Okay, he's just saying it. And what did you say, Sarah? None of his men are with him. Yeah, where are they? <laughs> Dead. Dead, yeah. He's the sole survivor. So, you know, how, how does anyone know that he didn't just slit their throats in the night, right? 
how does anyone know that Odysseus is truthfully relating the adventures that he's had and not just spinning a tale to win the support of the Phaeacians. There is evidence in various places that at least at certain points he is just spinning a tale. Or that he's just telling the Phaeacians what they want to hear. But we'll get to that a little later. So yeah, so this, the important thing, the thing that Odysseus wants, you know, the, the point of Odysseus is Nostos. Anybody remember what Nostos means? What was Nostos? It's the same, right? It comes, it, nostalgia, this is the root word of nostalgia, right? What, is, what does Nostos mean itself, though? Return. Return, exactly, yes. So, <clears throat> Nostos, in this case, is return to the original Oikos, to the original family home. So then we get a sort of um, a list of Odysseus's various adventures, right? He goes and he conducts a raid on these people called the Sicones. Now, this is a real, all right, this is a real nation, a real tribe. They're allied to the Trojans during the Trojan War. But at the time Odysseus attacks them, the war is over. And his ship is already laden with spoils from Troy, right? So his attack on these people is really just kind of greedy and spiteful. And it gives him a chance to sketch out the bad character of his men as well, right? From Ilion the wind took me to the Sicones and Ismeros. I pillaged the town and killed the men. The women and treasure that we took out, I divided as fairly as I could among all hands, and then gave the command to pull out fast. That was my order, but the fools wouldn't listen. They drank a lot of wine and slaughtered a lot of sheep and cattle on the shore. Some of the town's survivors got away inland and called their kinsmen. There were more of them, and they were braver too, men who knew how to fight from chariots and on foot. So the raid ends up being a disaster. But whose fault is it? It's the myth. Is it ever Odysseus' fault? No, it's never his fault when things go wrong, right? It's almost always blamed on one or more of his subordinates who aren't here to defend themselves. Right? Oh, if only he'd, if only he'd had better men. But this adventure with the Sicones is the last real world location Odysseus visits on his way home. This is the last identifiable place that he visits on his voyage. Right. They leave the land of the Sicones, and Zeus hit us with a norther, a freak hurricane. The clouds blotted out land and sea, and suddenly they find themselves um, in a kind of fantasy Mediterranean. Right. None of the other places that they visit are real, right? right? We have the lotus eaters, whose fruits causes men to become indolent and to no longer want to return home. We have the cyclopes, we'll talk about in a minute. The Isle of the Winds. The Westragonians, right? Because why not throw in more giant cannibals? And the adventure with the sorcerer Circe. So let's move on to talking about the island of the Cyclopes. What did you know? What, did you notice anything about the way Odysseus describes the island when he first arrives there? That they don't like it, Zeus provides everything for the second. Yeah. Like they don't have to do anything. 
Yeah, they don't really have to do very much, right? The land just provides. Yeah. If you look on page 428, we sailed on our morale sinking and we came to the land of the Cyclopes, lawless savages who leave everything up to the gods. These people neither plow nor plant, but everything grows for them unsown. Wheat, barley, and vines that bear clusters of grapes, watered by rain from Zeus, they have no assemblies or laws, but live in high mountain caves, ruling their own children and wives, and ignoring each other. So, they neither plow nor plant, Does this mean that they don't work at all? No. What do they do instead? They just the yeah, they're herdsmen. They herd sheep and goats. Now, in much ancient Middle Eastern literature, right, shepherd is a metaphor for king. But does it seem to work the same way in Greek literature, mm. right? If we think back to one of the first things we read, right? If we think back to uh, Hesiod's Theogony, right? And he gives his profession as shepherd. How do the muses seem to regard his shepherding? Yeah, you stupid hick, right? Listen to what we have to say to you, right? Even an idiot like you who herd sheep can still be inspired by the muses, right? So herding by the Greeks is not regarded as a civilized profession. Herdsmen live out in the mountains by themselves. They don't really have to work all that hard. Their work requires relatively little special knowledge. Or is farming, right? In order to do farming, you have to know shit. So farming, right, plowing and planting, this is a civilized activity. Herding is an uncivilized activity. Right, this is an, an accusation that uh, Greek writers were always leveling at their uh, sheep herding, cattle herding neighbors was that, you know, their their herding activities made them barbarians. Now, the other thing we see here, too, what do the Cyclopes live without? People? Yeah, they have no government, right? There are no public assemblies. There's no society to speak of, right? Um, there's a, a famous uh, a famous quote from Margaret Thatcher uh, you know, the conservative British prime minister, you know, she said, uh, there is no such thing as society. There are individual men and women and there are families. And the Cyclopes seem to believe this, right? So the Cyclopes do, to some extent, build oikoses. They build households, but those households don't add up to any larger society, right? Each household just does its own thing and they try to avoid meeting with each other. So there's no social, there's no social organization here. And then, as Odysseus lands on the island, right, a fertile island slants across the harbor's mouth, neither very close nor far from the Cyclope's shore. It's well wooded and populated with innumerable wild goats, uninhibited by human traffic. Not even hunters go there, tramping through the woods and roughing it on the mountainsides. It pastures no flocks, has no tilled fields, unplowed, unsown, virgin forever, bereft of men. All it does is support those bleeding goats. The Cyclopes do not sail and have no craftsmen to build them benched red proud ships that could supply all their wants crossing the sea to other cities, visiting each other as other men do. These same, these same craftsmen would have made this island into a good settlement. It's not a bad place at all, and would bear everything in season. Meadow li meadows lie by the seashore, lush and soft, where vines would thrive. It is level plowland with deep, rich soil that would produce bumper crops season after season. 
The harbor's good, too. No need for moorings, anchor stones, or tying up. Just beat your ship until the wind is right and you're ready to sail. At the harbor's head, a spring flows clear and bright from a cave surrounded by poplars. So what is Odysseus thinking about as he looks on this island? It's supposed to be awesome, but it's just a little more civilized. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great if some smart person came? Did a little work here, right? Showed them how to get maximum return from their land, right? Like he's speaking like almost like in the language of a real estate speculator here. Right? He's talking about the various things the land could be used for that these idiot barbarians aren't using it for. What might be the point of that? What might he be trying to demonstrate? Smarter than them? Yeah, he's smarter than they are. What makes him smarter than they are? Yeah, Larry. Uh, I was just thinking about his dream. Pardon? I was just thinking about his dream. Okay, yeah. He is a greedy, greedy bastard, right? He is always hungry for gifts, hungry for treasure, hungry for spoils, right? So this is one more way in which he is demonstrating his greed, right? But what he's also showing here is a level of cultural chauvinism. Right? These people aren't making this island work because they're barbarians. If a group of proper Greeks showed up here and took this place over, then, then we'd really see something, right? Then the economy would thrive. He um, seems to spend a lot of time at the operations. The people he's talking to, mm -hmm. their ship owners, they mentioned it several times. Yeah. And he spends a lot, of time, a lot of time discussing how the Cyclops don't have any ships, they don't build any ships. Uh huh. And But they have a really awesome harbor just sitting there. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great if somebody took advantage of that? Well, you know, and, and the whole shipbuilding thing, too, is like, look, I mean, I don't know how much you guys know about the geography of Greece. Shipbuilding was important. Shipbuilding was extremely important, yeah. I mean, it's basically mountains, two peninsulae, and islands, right? Lots and lots of islands. Um, so it's kind of hard to get around if you don't have ships. Not only that, but sea power was vital to any city-state that wanted to be politically important, right? You had to have a good, strong navy. So shipbuilding is, for the Greeks, another one of these kinds of measures of civilization, right? Civilized people, i.e. Greeks, build ships. Now, when they meet the Cyclops, right? We already know, okay, he lives in untamed land. He's a herdsman. What else indicates that he's not civilized? apart from the fact that he eats people. Right, that's the obvious. He lives in a cave. Okay. A yeah, okay, yep, lives in a cave, not a house. Why does Odysseus wait around in this creepy cave, apart from the fact that it's full of cheese and, you know, it's like, hey, free food? <laughs> he wants to see if um, the Cyclops would be like, with shot hospitality. Yeah. He wants to see if the, Cyclops, if the Cyclops is going to give him gifts, right? Which is what you're supposed to do when a guest shows up in your house. If you actually follow Greek customs. Right, so this is just one of those tests of civilization. Now the Cyclops does not give gifts, right? The Cyclops kills and eats people. Okay, last. yes. I'll eat you last, yes. <laughs> he, he gives Odysseus that gift in return uh, for telling him his false name, right? And giving him wine. And giving him wine, yeah. Yeah, uh, keep the wine in mind for a second, yeah. So there's the, the cave, no gifts, and the thing about the wine. 
I don't know how much any of you know about Greek wine, but um, essentially what it was, um, how many of you have ever had like at, a, like at a birthday party when you were a kid, like, they, like that syrupy concentrate juice that you have to pour into water to make it drinkable? Okay, Greek wine was actually like that. It was a concentrate that you had to mix with wine. Or had you mix with water. No, you don't mix it with more wine. You had to mix it with water. Um, if you did not mix it with water, then you were just imbibing like an incredible amount of alcohol, right? An incredibly powerful concentrated burst of alcohol. So the Cyclops, does he bother mixing the wine before he drinks it? Yeah, the fact that he drinks the wine unmixed also indicates savagery, right? Unfamiliarity with civilized customs. In fact, you know, Odysseus even kind of mocks him about this, right? That the, that, that big idiot just quaffed the whole bowl without any water. Much as he suspected, much as Odysseus suspected he would, right? Because Odysseus is a clever guy. So the basic point to be made about the Cyclopes on their island, right, is that we have here a completely different set of social circumstances than those to which Odysseus and his men are accustomed, right? This is, you know, we've not just left the real world, we've left the Greek world, right? Even in terms of fantasy. And each of the islands they visit in turn is going to, in some sense, present an alternative to the normal Greek way of doing things. So if we turn, uh, for example, to the beginning of Book 10, right, the Island of the Winds, page 438. We came next to the island of Aeolia, home of Aeolus, son of Hippotus, Dear to the immortals, Aeolia is a floating island surrounded by a wall of indestructible bronze set on sheer stone. Aeolus' twelve children live with, there with him, six daughters and six manly sons. He married his daughters off to his boys, and they all sit with their father and mother, continually feasting on abundant good cheer spread out before them. Every day the house is filled with steamy savor, and the courtyard resounds. Every night the men sleep next to their highborn wives and blankets strewn on their corded beds. We came to their city and their fine palace, and for a full month he entertained me. Right, so what do we notice about the Island of the Winds here? What's weird? Okay, yeah, that there don't seem to be very many people here, and the brothers and sisters are all married to each other. Now. Incest was a taboo among the ancient Greeks, but it was not among a lot of their neighbors. The Egyptians, for example, particularly in noble families, tended to marry as close to the line as possible. Right, you know, you would often have, particularly in the royal family, brothers married to sisters in uh, ancient Egypt. Right, the idea was to try to keep the royal bloodline as pure as possible and to prevent there being rival claimants for the throne. Now, the other problem that this led to was, uh, you know, they didn't understand genetics. Um, so they didn't get um, that, oh, you're, you're actually, uh, you know, you're just asking for various uh, genetic disorders. Yeah, Darius. Isn't that what King said or something? Um, Maybe. Um, it, it, it certainly happened uh, with uh, the pharaoh who was uh, believed to be either Tut's father or grandfather, Akhenaten. Like, if you look at statues um, of Akhenaten, right, most statues of Egyptian rulers are kind of idealized. Um, Akhenaten statues show a really weird looking dude uh, with a lot of recessive genes. And yeah, all of the, but yeah, um, King Tut himself may have had uh, 
I think they believe he may, may have had some kind of spinal disorder. He had several. Yeah. He had legs. Yeah. One like hips, left palate. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and yeah, and, and this this would have been like there was um, in some uh, in some European noble families in the Middle Ages, even um, schizophrenia was a mark of considered a mark of nobility. So, you know, <laughs> so the, these practices did these practices didn't necessarily die with the Egyptians, right? But yeah, this was something that for the Greeks was a taboo. Greeks weren't supposed to do this. Right, brother-sister marriage is not okay. But what does he get from Aeolus when he gets to the island? Yeah, he gets gifts, right? In particular, this bag of winds. So Aeolus is I like these people are not Greek, right? They don't practice Greek all the Greek customs, but they are, yeah, to some extent civilized. Right? They give him that bag of winds. The other thing to note about the difference between Aeolus's people and normal Greeks, right, is that right, Aeolus's people don't have to work, right? They just party and feast all the time. There don't seem to be any ordinary moral consequences for them. So he gets this bag of winds, and how's that go? Um, on the ship, the, uh -huh. the crew thought that it was a bag of like, gold and silver, so they opened it and yep. they pushed them all the way back. To the same island they yeah. Whole things, yeah. Whole things go. Whole thing goes pear shaped, right? right next to it. And whose fault is it that everything goes pear shaped? The crew. It's the crew. It's the greedy crew that just they just don't trust him, right? If only they trusted him, then yeah, then they'd all be home in Ithaca. If he was asleep, how do you hear him say all this stuff? That's <laughs> exactly. Well, so that, yeah, there are all of these little, just little tiny holes. In Odysseus's story, right? No one questioned it. No, well, on the one hand, there, there is a point um, in the Hades episode where it sounds almost like Alcinous is saying, "Like, look, like I don't care if you're telling the truth. This is such a good story, right?" And that's the thing is, like, it is such a good story that on a certain level, it doesn't really matter if he's telling the truth, right? Now, when they return to the island. Does Aeolus show them the same hospitality? No, he said he's cursed. Yeah, he's like, get, get thee gone, dickweed, right? Get off my island. Yes? Was, um, I might have missed it. Was he cursed before Poseidon cursed him? It's what he does to the Cyclops that gets him cursed. Uh, also, like, what happened to him in Cyclops that had him, like, yeah, no, yeah, the, 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 the gods don't really give a crap about, you know, a bunch of, you know, there's a small tribe of people whom Odysseus decides to raid. What they do care about is injuries to their own relatives. I don't know about him in the Troy. What's that? Well, I remember one of the gods being upset with him when he was leaving Troy. Well, I mean, you know. And presumably the Trojans. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, the, you know, Tro Troy was also was Troy was fated to fall either way. Like this, this is actually another thing to note. I'll get to you in a second, there, Chris. Um, Greeks were big believers. In fate, right? It was personified as three goddesses um, who wove out the thread of your life, right? The um, Clotho, the Weaver. Wove the thread. Lachesis, the measurer, measured out its length, and Atropos, the cutter, cut it at the end. Um, even the gods were subject to the dictates of fate. What was fated to happen to you was going to happen to you, whether you liked it or not, whatever you did to avoid it. But how it came about could vary. And so I want to actually look briefly at two points here that speak to that. Uh, the first is the Cyclops' curse on Odysseus. If you look on page 437, I had my say, and he prayed to Poseidon, stretching his arms out to starry heaven. 
Hear me, Poseidon, blue-maned earth holder. If you are the father you claim to be, grant that Odysseus, son of Laertes, may never reach his home in Ithaca. But if he is fated to see his family again and return to his home and his own native land, may he come late, having lost all companions in another ship and find trouble at home. Now, if we look also in Book 11, on page 453, Tiresias' prophecy. You seek a homecoming sweet as honey, shining Odysseus, but a god will make it bitter, for I do not think you will elude the earth shaker, who has laid up wrath in his heart against you, furious because you blinded his son. Still, you just might get home, though not without pain, you and your men, if you curb your own spirit, and theirs too, when you beach your ship on Thrinacia. You will be marooned on that island in the violet sea, and there find there the cattle of Helios the sun and his sheep too grazing. Leave these unharmed, keep your mind on your homecoming, and you may still reach Ithaca, though not without pain. But if you harm them, I foretell doom for you, your ship and your crew. And even if you yourself escape, you will come home late and badly, having lost all companions and in another ship. What do you notice about these two prophecies? What are they full of? Okay, what's similar about them? Okay. Mm -hmm. also, he's not very smart. Like, he's clever, but his <laughs> men beg him, please don't yell. He yells, I'm Odysseus, I'm from Ithaca. Uh huh. And then he gets cursed. So yeah. And the, but this is also a way he can explain his reluctance to reveal his name mm -hmm. to the Phaeacians immediately, right? Well, last time I revealed my name to somebody who didn't go so well. <laughs> but what else is similar? Just on the level of language. Is there a particular word or type of word that recurs a lot in these two prophecies? Just a little tiny word. Yeah, Larry. Word pain. Not pain. What if? Yeah. There's a lot of you may, you might, if, right? There are a lot of conditional statements in these prophecies, right? If you do this, then this. If you don't do this, then this, right? So the ultimate end is known, right? The ultimate end is already determined by fate. But there's all sorts of other stuff that could happen as you try to work your way there. Over which Right? The seer, the prophet, has no control. Right? I can see this path for you if you do this. I can see this other path for you if you do this. I'm sorry, what, so what were you going to say, Chris? I'm sorry. That... Oh, no, no. So, so you already pointed out how stupid that he said his, you know, name, you know, especially where he lived and stuff. Uh-huh. But um, since you already mentioned, like, mentioned that the gods and this kind of, like, you know, these stories aren't really on mission, do you think it's possible mm -hmm. that if he didn't say it, he could still have cursed? Like, say that there was a prayer offered up that whoever did this would be cursed or does it not work? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess it could, yeah, but um, offering up his name gives the Cyclops a very specific focus. <laughs> um, and it makes it much more likely that the curse will be, uh, will be heard and enacted, right? So, yeah, um, probably not the smartest thing Odysseus ever does in his journeys. But again, there's a reason for every little tale he tells, right? And we can never be certain that he is being entirely honest. And at certain points, we can be fairly certain that he's not being entirely honest. All right, so we go from the Isle of the Winds. Oh, um, last thing about the Isle of the Winds. So he returns... And Aeolus tells him to go away. Should Aeolus have shown him hospitality a second time? Yeah, he has no obligation to do so, right? If you offer someone hospitality and they do something to muck it up, 
you are not then required to offer it again. Right? He already gave Odysseus a pretty great gift. And Odysseus and his men squandered it. So there's so Aeolus is in no way obligated to give him another. Or feed him, or shelter him, or do anything, right? He's already done his part. You're required to take in and shelter the stranger once. If they come back and ask for more, you're not required to give them more. Right, so, what, so Odysseus is in that kind of abusing Aeolus's hospitality and goodwill. Now, this Lestragonians episode, now, it helps to understand this if we think about the probable origins of this epic, right? Do you remember what the origins of the Gilgamesh epic were? What existed before there was an epic? The stories. Right, a collection of unconnected stories that all happened to the same protagonist, right? The Odyssey's origins are probably pretty similar. There are all of these traditional stories about the hero Odysseus that are then compiled later into a single narrative. And many of these stories are going to have some similar features. Now, the interesting thing about the Lestragonians story is that it seems to combine two other stories. Right? On the one hand, right, we have giant cannibals who do what for a living? Herdsmen. Yep, and they're herdsmen. But, what do they have on their island that the Cyclopes didn't? Cities. Yeah, they have a city. Pardon? Slash structure. Yeah, they clearly, they have a king, they have some you know, form of government. They have a city and a king. So, what we have here like, are barbarians who present to Odysseus the illusion of civilization, right? And how does he find the city of the Lestragonians? He was led there by the daughter of the king. Yeah. He happens to run into the daughter of the king, right? So what it seems has happened in the Lestragonians episode, right, we have... The Cyclopes episode kind of meshed together with the Nausicaa episode, right? It's like the Nausicaa episode, but it goes horribly, horribly wrong. Right? They are led to believe that they are being brought to a civilized place. And then, of course, more men end up devoured. Excuse me. So, the last two episodes that we really ought to spend some time on here because they're particularly important um, when talking first about um, Greek gender relations and also sort of Greek ideas of magic um, and Greek ideas of the afterlife. Right. So, what did you think of the Circe episode? Did you notice anything particularly interesting or weird there? What's that? She has a wand. Okay, yeah, she has a wand. And what does her wand do? Turn into pigs. Turns men into pigs, yes. So we know that Circe has the power to turn men into animals, right? What else does she have? What does she have working in concert with the wand? Yeah, she's a, the, the, the drug in a cup, right? So yeah, she's a cup and a wand. Now, these are important 
as gendered symbols, right? A wand, right, is a phallic symbol. Represents masculine energy, masculine power. A cup is what's called a yonic symbol. And a yonic symbol is essentially the opposite of a phallic symbol, right? A yonic symbol is, you know, a representative of feminine energy, feminine power. So usually, like, if you see objects in myth that are long, straight, and typically wielded as weapons, those are going to be phallic symbols. What's that? Teacup. What? On Get Out. Oh, I haven't seen. I haven't seen that yet. Oh. Well, oh. Yeah, she had a teacup. Okay. So yeah, anything like, like a cup, anything that's sort of like, you know, concave within, right? Cups, cauldrons, things like that. Those are those will be often be yonic symbols. Yes. Would that be kind of like a symbolize of like a stomach, like if you were giving birth, kind of like that? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 it's it's a it, it's a womb symbol basically. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah, let's not go thanking Dan Brown for anything. Um. No, he just he mentions it in um, Da Vinci Gun a lot. Oh, yeah. Big chapter, just this, I'm this, 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 that. I'm like, sure there is. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he, I mean, he, he's, not, he's not pulling that out of nowhere. He is I, sort I of, yeah. But, it, yeah. Um, so what's important about this, right, is that Cersei's wielding both, right? Are there any men? who are not transformed into animals on Cersei's island. Before they get there. Yeah, before they get there, it's an, it's an all-female society, right? All women. And Cersei runs the show. Now, in order to have a proper Greek oikos, what do you need? A man and a woman, right? So she, the cup and the wand, she represents both. Exactly. But it's a flawed order, right? From a Greek perspective. Right? Because she abuses her power and turns it against her guests. So what needs to happen from a Greek perspective in order to put Circe's island in order? Yeah, essentially, yeah. Odysseus has to come in and master her, right? Right, I mean, let's think about it. You know, Hermes, a god, not the usual helper of Odysseus, right? Odysseus' usual ally is the goddess Athena. But in this case, the god Hermes shows up, tells him where to find the magic herb, and tells him what to do to defeat Circe, right? And essentially, what does he have to do to defeat Circe? Yep. And he does all this using what? His sword, yeah. Right, another phallic symbol. Right, he is always referring to the sharp sword that hangs by his thigh, right? If you, uh, if you miss what's going on there at all. Oh, I'm every, every, every time you see a sword in any that evolution, people always trying to make the argument that it's a phallic object. Sometimes a sword is just a sword. No. What about soldiers that have curved swords? Because <coughs> there's a lot of swords in a lot of different shapes and sizes in the world. And a lot of them have pretty steep curves. That, that is true, and you know, I, I have actually never thought about that. <laughs> I'm not sure it's relevant to the current example well, because a Greek sword certainly would have yeah, been. Was yeah. Straight. straight. Yeah. Rather small in comparison to a lot of those swords. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
In this case, what matters is how Odysseus uses it, right? What he does with it. And what he does with it is create a normal oikos, right? A normal functioning oikos from a Greek perspective, right? Once he comes in there and frees his men, right? Makes Circe take the oath and becomes the man of the island for a year, she stops doing the things that she was doing, right, that were offensive to Greek sensibilities, right? Right, he, you know, he, so he comes in and he masters the goddess and her house is now his. And that's the, the basic point here is that what Odysseus has been brought here to do is create a normal oikos. That's the point of him landing on this island. Now, another thing um, to notice as well, like for someone who seems to just really, really want to get home to his wife, um, Odysseus doesn't really seem to have a lot of qualms about having sex with other women, right? Mm -hmm. And from a, an ancient Greek perspective, this will be relevant when we talk about Medea next time. That's actually completely normal. And he's more or less within his rights to do that. Um, outside of the home, the man was largely free to do whatever he wanted, associate with whoever he wanted, have sex with whoever he wanted. And there wasn't really a hell of a lot his wife could do about it. She could divorce him if he was abusive, in which case she would then go back to her father or her brothers provided she had any living and local. But yeah, um, by and large, men were sort of sexually free to do as they, to do as they liked um, in ancient Greece. So there's really not much that Odysseus' wife could have uh, legally done about any of this. So that's what's going on essentially with the Circe episode. Now, I do want to talk about Hades as well, because I think there's a lot that's important thematically going on here that relates to other things we've been talking about in the course. Right? Basically, every text we've looked at thus far, there's been some discussion of afterlife concepts, right? or lack of afterlife concept in the case of the ancient Israelites. What's the Greek afterlife look like? <laughs> What's that? Most of it's dark. Except for fields. Mm -hmm. These happy little fields of asphodel, right? The Elysian fields is actually um, a later concept. Um, the idea that heroes get to go someplace special. Um, for the most part, it's just dark and cold. Yeah, it's dark and cold. And do the spirits have any memory of their former lives? Not unless they drink the blood of a yeah, they have to drink the blood of the, what kind of sacrifice? <clears throat> cathonic sacrifice, yes. He has to make that cathonic sacrifice. Right, he has to dig a pit, slaughter a ram and a ewe that are positioned in a particular way, and let the blood drain out into the pit, right? And then he has to keep the spirits away with his sword until he's ready to let them speak. Yes? Was it the Greek who put the coin under the tongue? Yes, although that is also a, a later tradition. Um, Romans did it too. Um, the Roman afterlife is basically a continuation of uh, Greek ideas. Um, much of Roman religion is uh, sort of adaptation from or to um, Greek ideas. Um, but yeah, um, the typical funeral practice uh, for Greeks in this particular period uh, was burning the body um, with their grave goods, right? So you would put the body on a pyre, burn it, and that frees the spirit to then go down into uh, the underworld. This is why, you know, um, Elpinor, uh, Odysseus's comrade, whom they didn't even realize was dead, and they found here, right? He broke his neck falling off a roof on Circe's island, right? 
he is chastising Odysseus because he hasn't been buried yet. He hasn't had a proper, he, he hasn't been burned yet. He hasn't had a proper funeral. And he can't genuinely cross over and become like these other spirits until he's had a proper funeral. But yeah, with the exception of Tiresias, these shades have no memory of their former lives unless they drink the blood. Now, why, why blood? Pardon? Well, yeah, dead body doesn't have blood. It represents like life. Yeah, exactly. This is a kind of substitute life, right? They drink the life of the sacrifice and it temporarily regenerates them so that they can once again communicate with the living. And when they do communicate, what are they most concerned about? Did you notice that there's a particular thing that almost all of them harp on? Okay, they, they all want to know what's going on in the world above, right? But about particular people. Kids generally? Yeah. Yeah, they want to know about their sons. They don't really ask about daughters. But they ask about their sons. Even Odysseus's mother, right? What, what did she die of? Grief, heartbreak for her lost son, right? Everybody is harping on the importance of sons. Exactly, yeah, the sons are the dead person's living legacy. They carry the name, the values, the goods, whatever, of the parents on in the world above. Right, so in the Mesopotamian afterlife, the important thing was to be remembered up above, right? For the Greeks, the more important thing is to have living male descendants. Right, to actually have your bloodline carried on in the world above. This is your actual legacy. Other things you did while alive, other deeds you performed, don't actually matter all that much. Like uh, when we see Achilles appear before <clears throat> Odysseus. Odysseus butters him up and talks about how splendid he was among all the Achaeans. Or, oh, you were the greatest of the Greeks. You know, how, how wonderful it must be for you down here. I spoke, page 463, and he answered me at once. Don't try to sell me on death, Odysseus. I'd rather be a hired hand back up on earth, slaving away for some poor dirt farmer, than lord it over all these withered dead. But tell me about that boy of mine. Right. His great deeds in the world above don't matter. They didn't get him any special privileges in the afterlife, right? There's no good afterlife. There is a bad one you, we see here if you've done particularly horrible things, um, usually if you've pissed off some god or other. But yeah, there's no reward in the Greek afterlife. What you want is to have your son continue the family legacy after you. And that's what he's worried about. That's what he's concerned about. That's what virtually all of these shades are most concerned about. And we also have in this portion um, one of those uh, one of those bits that suggests that Alcinous doesn't one hundred percent believe. Odysseus, and that he doesn't really care, and that Odysseus is just sort of making things up 
to please his host. Right on page 460, right? Alcinous answered him, Odysseus, we do not take you for the sort of liar and cheat the dark earth breeds among men everywhere, telling tall tales no man could ever test for himself, right? Wink, wink. Your words have outward grace and wisdom within, and you have told your tale with the skill of a bard, right? Highly embellished. All of the Greeks and you yourself have suffered, but tell me this as accurately as you can. Did you see any of your godlike comrades who went with you to Troy and met their fate there? The night is young and magical. It is not yet time to sleep in the hall. Tell me these wonders. Sit in our hall and tell us of your woes for as long as you can bear. I could listen until dawn, right? I don't care if your story is true, right? This is good stuff. Keep spinning. And Odysseus, his mind teeming, right? His mind teeming always suggests invention, right? Plotting, thinking. Lord Alcinous, most glorious of men, there's a time for words and a time for sleep, but if you still yearn to listen, I will not refuse to tell you of other things more pitiable st uh, still. The woes of my comrades who died after the war, who escaped the Trojans in a battle cry, but died in their return through a woman's evil. Right, so Odysseus would have ended his story there, right? But Alcinous asked for more, so, yeah, all right, I'll give you more. Sure. I'll keep talking as long as you want me to. <clears throat> All right, so does anybody have any further questions, particularly about anything conceptual related to ancient Greece, since we're going to be on this stuff for a couple more days? Any questions about oikos, nostos, fate, afterlife, gender relations, any of this stuff? Okay, a lot of these themes are going to be particularly important as you read Medea, right? And please, um, just this is a personal pet peeve of mine, right? This is a Greek play by Euripides. It is not a Tyler Perry movie. The spelling is Medea with an E. So let me just call up reading questions, which are going to be here somewhere. <coughs> okay, and of course, this is the one time that they're not. I must have forgotten my flash drive, so I will email them to you. Um, but yeah, before you go, let me return your reading quizzes to you.